Welcome to Liberty Explained, your guide to libertarianism. Our goal is to share libertarian solutions for the future. Visit libertyexplained.com to subscribe to the podcast and to search our library of issues and different book recommendations. We are part of the We Are Libertarians podcast network. My name is Chris Spangle. My co-host is Julia Geyer. Thank you so much for being here, Julia. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And so we're always taking your questions. And if you want to write in, ask at wearelibertarians.com. And today's question is, what would education look like in a libertarian society? This is a popular question. We got this kind of question a lot. Uh, and I would, I would like to start by prefacing, Julia, that as with everything we discuss on this program, we're not talking about a utopian vision of education. We don't talk about the utopian ideas a lot of times. We try to give you actionable, progressible solutions. We're progressing towards yeah. liberty. We're anti-progressives, I guess. Um, every effort involved in education. So this is a really important thing. Uh, there's a distinction. There's a book by Thomas Sowell called The Conflict of Visions. There's the one group of people who think that they can perfect human behavior through laws. And then there's libertarians who think, let's craft laws and systems around human nature because we can't change human beings fundamentally. So even in a libertarian educational system, a libertarian medical system, a libertarian political system, you're still dealing with human beings that are flawed. Human beings are flawed. They have bad decision making. Uh, what we strive for here on Liberty Explained is optimal outcomes for people like students and teachers. So it's hard for one person to predict how education would unfold once the monopoly of school, uh, sc government schooling is lifted because markets empower millions of individuals to collaborate using their talents. Somebody out there, Julie is a model for a living. I don't have that ability, but I'm so glad that people like Julia out there can do it, right? Somebody <laughs> wakes up every morning and thinks, I'm going to be the best darn turnip grower this planet has ever seen. I don't know <laughs> anything about growing turnips, but that, that combined collaboration of all of our different talents uh, creates something incredible, and one mind is less adequate than a million minds. And so this powerful creative opportunity is at the heart of the libertarian schooling model, School choice allows the system that was created uh, 150 years ago to create good working robots is outdated. And people like te yeah. teachers unions often fight to keep those systems in place and restrict the amount of innovation that we could could have. So despite opposing government schools, we're not anti-school in any way, shape, or form. We're pro-teacher. We're pro-education. We're pro-parent. And mm -hmm. libertarians believe a new way of educating students must flourish in the internet age. Rote memorization, Julia, just isn't adequate for knowledge work. You know, we are we are both gig workers. You know, we need yeah. we need skills like critical thinking, problem solving, and a structure that supports self discipline, mm -hmm. as opposed to just like you know reading these books and memorizing dates. We've got to yeah. get out of the mindset of the old way of educating. It just seems so, so dated at this point. Like what, like you and I are like in our thirties, like real world, just working and like thinking about like learning like that. And like, God, <laughs> like, I feel like the skills I came out of school with, like I didn't have any skills. None. I don't, I don't sit at eight hours in a single place anymore. And that was the point of no. attaching a child to a desk is to get them used yeah. to sitting and learning i mean Aww. you and i are like dynamic through our day let's yeah. go do this you know we have a lot of choice there's a lot of and that's where the world of work is going so uh, i mean if you would like well, let's define education like what are we talking about yeah. when we talk about education um well we we often think of it as like sitting in a classroom for eight hours a day like you said like in a physical building but you know, education is really the expansion of an individual's mind. And um, if the old way of education produces no real growth in understanding for a person, then I, it really can't be considered education. Um, we libertarians firmly believe that every individual is a genius at something. And 
we talk about that a lot. And, and, and I really do believe that in my heart. I think that every person is born with a gift and something that they're talented at and something that they're really meant for, you know, and um, our goal is to empower parents to help their children excel at their natural abilities that they're born with. And, you know, like imposing the traditional sit and chair for hours on end and listen to a lecture and read this textbook model, it really handicaps the creativity of both the teacher and the student. And like, I can personally attest to this because I had a terrible time in school when I was young because I was so creative and I had so much energy and I wanted to do so much. And I've never been like a worker bee, you know, like someone right. who's like doing the, I don't know, the nine to five thing. Like I just don't function like that. Um, and I am highly creative. I'm an artist and I like getting my hands into things and I love making money and I love business, but public school was so terrible for me because I just felt like they were just trying to break my soul. Hmm. And I was like, you're not going to break my soul. Yeah. And I fought them like the whole way. And it was just like, really hard. And like, I'm a self starter and I am someone who I start businesses and I love to be an entrepreneur. And I think that our society desperately needs people like that. And a public school education is a lot of the time really damaging. Yeah. It's, like it's that. a way to, I mean, for some people it is about breaking the spirit and introducing the idea yes. of submission and, you know, if you look at the traditional model of schooling, it was meant to create worker bees. It was meant to, yes. you know, for a time when people would go and work at the same company for 30 years, as opposed to, now I love school. I had a great schooling experience. I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd. Uh, I like systems. So I found a lot of it to be beneficial. Um, but I also was not very self-disciplined as a student. And mm -hmm. there wasn't really much help in that except just do it, just do it, just do it. There wasn't like, that's true. Let's work right. with how you work and figure out that way, or let's right. adapt the model to a Julia and see how we can get her to, to right. learn better, better. And the internet yeah. gives us a model for innovation. And I, I will uh, say, does. you know, we have in Indiana, a lot of great schools. So, you know, the the IPS system, my nieces go to something called a magnet school, and they go mm -hmm. to, like, a, a STEM school. And essentially what happened, like, the Friedman Foundation is based here, the Lumina Foundation, all these big educational choice foundations are located here. And so for 20, 30 years, Indianapolis has been kind of an incubator of school choice ideas. And IPS was very broken, like most, you know, inner city school systems. People moved to the suburbs, like my parents went to Plainfield because that had great school systems and would never have thought of sending us to IPS. My sister was a teacher, was never going to send her kids to IPS. But a Democratic mayor introduced charter schools to the city of Indianapolis, and the competition forced IPS to reform itself, introduce like the magnet school concepts. One of the schools is an art based system that you would thrive in. One of them is a, a, you know, a vocational based where, you know, you have a lot of different choices. And so now you, you know, a lot of uh, teachers who are uh, kind of look at what the teachers union say, don't like charter schools. Oh, they don't pay as well. Yes. And no, you have more choice as to where you can go. Uh, you have more choice where you can send your kids. You have different models being taught in some of these schools. And then when you look at the pandemic, Julia, and you talk about innovation on the internet, you know, with these cheap and low barrier to entry, thanks to liver, little government in, you know, inference, look at the rapid in, you know, innovation and change and adoption that we've had over the last couple of years. I mean, I don't know about you, but on my feed, I've seen, you know, teaching pods and different ways to homeschool and unschool and, you know, Montessori stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable the different ways that you can now educate your child if you want to go that route, thanks to yeah. the pandemic forcing everybody to kind of like listen to the way that their kid was being taught and find better models. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome, actually. Like, I feel like that's one of the silver linings that came out of 
um, lockdown was that for the first time, like, I think parents actually really got involved um, in like understanding, you know, what their kids were going through at school, what their experience was. Um, and they cared more, they care more now. And I like that. I think that's amazing. And we saw it across the board, like so many kids are just like alternative learning now. And I think that's a step in the right direction. I think it's progress. I do too. And you know, now what are we going to learn in like a libertarian school? Are you just going to read Ayn Rand every day and you know, (laughs) crypto one hour hating the government the next. Um, oh, man, this sounds so good. You know, and, and <laughs> if I were a libertarian emperor and I were creating education, from a broad view, K-12 through schools might not look that much different than they do now in terms of the subjects taught. The difference will come in smaller classroom sizes, more options for schools closer to parents, happier teachers that earn more based on effort and skill, and a greater selection in curriculums and teaching methods. One of the worst parts that I've watched teachers struggle with over the last few years is their inability to teach because they're teaching to a test. They're teaching to a method the administration wants. They're yeah. teaching to keep angry parents off their back. And they're not really being able to uh, to teach in the way that they're – these are skilled people who deserve to teach the way that they want. And the classic liberal arts education will still be relevant despite an emphasis on specialization. So things like reading, arithmetic, writing, uh, you know, rhetoric, all the classic liberal, liberal things, math, social studies, they're still relevant because exposure to understanding and mastering the broad spectrum of human knowledge enriches the life and potential of students while helping them learn where their emphasis might be placed. So while while a person may not be proficient in math, English, history, or science, it's still beneficial to a growing brain to make sure. So when we talk about specialization, we're not necessarily talking about neglecting all the different varieties of subjects that you need to learn. No, no, not at all. And I I think, I think it's like important to stress the point that I think so many people like when they talk about education, exploring it from a libertarian perspective, they really focus on what is the student's experience. But I think it's so relevant to talk about what is the teacher's experience? Because like you just said, it really hinders the teachers. And I think obviously that's the kids miss out on a lot of wisdom and education that they could be getting from all kinds of wonderful people that could be teaching. But the teachers are limited to what they can teach. And I don't think that's productive as a society. Um, Well, it turns out when you have 435 bureaucrats in Washington, DC plan out curriculum across the country, it, uh, it doesn't work as well as highly individual, you know, individualization where communities are working together amongst teachers, parents, administrators to craft what they're going to teach, what they're going to vet. So moving towards centralization has not been good for education over these last 10, 20 years. No, it's been very narrowing. And, you know, um, I don't know. I think I think in a libertarian uh, style of education, like parents, teachers and administrators would work together and they would adapt their educational style and curriculum toward meeting the needs of like the student and the community at large, like you just said. So, yeah, I mean, a great example of this. So I did a public affairs radio show called now hear this. And I talked to the hope Academy and it's a charter school here in Indianapolis that serves teens struggling with addiction. And the high school serves basically as a safe place for students to grow, you know, intellectually and personally. And they have specialized programs for students that are dealing with, alcohol and drug addiction or other types of addiction. And you have a mix of counseling along with, uh, you know, your, your traditional science and math and English. Um, and that's, that's a sort of a great example of what we're talking about is that specialization that meets the student where they're at. Niche. Like that student, it meets those students needs and they could have that for, like like the charter schools, like you were saying, they could have it for artistic students or students that are really scientific or 
really math brained or, you know, like there's so many different types or really entrepreneurial or yeah. really high energy. Like, I don't know, like <laughs> if we had an open educational system that was just like function like a free market, I think it would be so exciting to see what would, what would come up from that because it would be amazing. Yeah. One, one movement across the country is money following the students. And so instead of uh, b- basically IPS sends out vans to collect students for the first two weeks of school that, are, that might be true because they need to get their, the amount of students that they have in the first two weeks is the amount of money that will be given to that particular school for the rest of the year. Oh, as so as like opposed weird. to <laughs> money basically being put into a sort of trust for parents, them choosing where they want to send their kids, and then that money goes to a private school, a charter school, a magnet school, a public school. You know, if if I if my parents had their way, they wouldn't have sent me anywhere other than Plainfield High School. It was a great mm-hmm. education. It was a great public school system. You know, my sister lives in Indianapolis, and she sends her kids to IPS by choice. Uh, but for those who live in areas where the education isn't as, you know, optimal, then let's yeah. fund the schools that are doing it right and make it, you know, put parents in charge of decisions as to where their kids go as opposed to geography. You know, and that's another thing right. that Indianapolis has done is they kind of b- made it a lottery and blown up the geography. You're going to the school around the corner. Um, one other aspect of the libertarian view of education, students would not be required to go to school. Now, this is controversial, Julia. Everybody's yeah. face kind of puckered. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is most kids want to go to school. And most parents want to send their kids to school. And according to Mary Ruard's book, Short Answers to Tough Questions, a survey was done in Boston in the early 1800s, and 90% of student of parents sent their children to school. Non-compul- and that's when you weren't forced to go to school. Non-compulsory right. education improves the performance of classrooms by removing the students that don't want to attend. Disruptions prevent barriers to entry. So like many ideas offered by pro-government voices, truancy laws are a security blanket that helps them feel as if they've done something good. But in reality, if a student does not want to attend school, they they won't even go under our current laws. They and, don't. And like I said, they have the vans picking up for two weeks, but after two weeks, they don't care. Peace. And you know, I think actually this really, this really hurts low-income families the most because when a child is, you know, not going to school and they're breaking truancy laws, it forces the parents to miss a day at work, go to court, chase their kids around. I mean, they're already having a hard time with their teen at home and then they get the courts involved. And I feel like it's like, it's, I feel like it, it criminalizes these kids in a way. And it's, it's wrong because and the parents too, like, and you know, I, I'm sure a lot of parents are listening to this that have teens and we all know you, you really can't control teenagers. Like they're kind of wild, you know, like a lot of them are just, especially the ones that don't want to go to school. They're not going to school. Are you speaking you know? from experience here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a lot of my friends too, like we all just were like, no. So you know, I, I just think that it's wrong to criminalize that. And I think that an ideal, uh, an ideal um, alternative would be to have other options in a free market, uh, you know, education system where a student like me, when I was young, I was high energy, creative, wanted to work, wanted to create, build, build, build. I didn't want to sit and be drilled to about boring history and wars. I was just like, oh my God, I'm wasting my brain. So, you know, if there could be a school for kids like that, that maybe they don't just not want to go to school. Maybe they want to do something else. Yeah. And I think that's fine. It's just a waste of their time to prevent them from doing something else. Yeah. So, I mean, who doesn't love freedom? Who doesn't love choice? Right? So, uh, hopefully we've convinced you uh thank you so much for listening today uh i want to thank julia for being here thank you to uh the folks who wrote in and asked this question 
And we'd love to hear whatever questions you might have, so please email us at ask at wearelibertarians.com. If you enjoyed the conversation, please share it with a friend or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts. And we will see you again in just a couple weeks.